you head up there. And uh, for the rest of us, we're going to dive into God's Word as well without uh, any of the other fun activities that they have planned. But if you have a Bible, why don't you turn with me to 1 John chapter 3. Throughout the summer, we've been working through 1 John, and i got to say, this is a book that challenges us, it encourages us, it, it spurs us towards faith in Jesus and, and living that faith out. It's been, a, it's been a really good journey, I think, for us through this book of, of 1 John. This morning, we're going to be looking at verses, uh, chapter 3, verses 1 through 10. And as you finish turning there, let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Father, we thank you that we don't have to guess at who you are or what you've done for us, but that you've told us in your word about how you've loved us and sent your son to die for our sins so that we may have new life with you. And so, Father, this morning as we read your word, as we study it together, we pray, God, that you would enable us to understand even in the things that are difficult and that you give us the strength to walk in obedience even in the areas that we struggle. God, we pray that your Holy Spirit would guide us in this time, not only now, but in our lives as we seek to live in response to your love for us. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, I don't know about you guys, but every now and then when I'm reading Scripture, I come across a verse that I just don't really know what to do with. And, and, and I think there's a number of reasons we might experience a verse like this. Oftentimes, though, it's, it's when you come across a verse that maybe you don't initially see how this fits your previously held theological convictions. In other words, you, you already kind of have your beliefs about who God is and what he's done and how things work in this world. And this verse seems to challenge what you already believe theologically. Or maybe in another way, there, it, it's a verse that challenges your lived experience. You say, okay, I understand theologically maybe how this verse works, but this just doesn't seem to match what my lived experience is, and we wrestle with a verse for that reason. Sometimes we see a verse that does both of these things. A verse that we say, this doesn't really fit my theological beliefs, and I also don't feel like I... I see a match in my lived experience, and we, we wrestle no, to know what to do with a verse like that. 1 John 3, verse 9, I believe, is one of these verses. At least it, it, it is for many people. This is what it says. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning. For God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, what's so difficult about that verse? Why, why would you say that this is one of those verses? Because you might be saying, we, we already know about this idea of being born of God. John talks about this in different places of this spiritual birth we receive from God. So, so that doesn't seem too difficult. And you might also say, we also recognize and we've seen throughout the book of 1 John that a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ must express itself through righteous and holy living before God. There's a natural expression of our relationship with God through faith in Jesus. So what makes this verse so challenging? Well, it's what John writes in the second half of the verse. The English Standard Version of the Bible that I just read from, it's, it's a very good translation, but I fear it doesn't bring across the full weight of what John is saying here, or at least there's a potential for us to miss it. In the last part of the verse, John says that the one born of God cannot keep on sinning. And there's a way to understand that in English as if it's more of a suggestion or, or a good idea. In other words, when someone's doing something that we don't want them to, we say, hey, you can't do that. In other words, you shouldn't be doing that or you're not allowed to do that. But when John says that the one born of God can't keep on sinning, he's saying that the one born of God is unable to keep on sinning. Or we might even translate it, the one who is born of God is unable to sin. And now you can see why this verse is so challenging. Even Bible commentators struggle to explain this verse theologically and in terms of our lived experience. And you see this in the way that they devote so much time to talking about this verse. 
If you, if you glance at a commentary, most of them would be verse 6, half a page explanation. Verse 7, half a page. Verse 8, half a page. Verse 9, seven pages, right? It's, it's something where they're looking at this and saying, how can we explain what's going on theologically and how can we help people to see how this verse can fit with their lived experience? How can John say that those who have been born of God are unable to sin it seems like there's so many verses in the New Testament that contradict this idea. We can think of some of them, even some from this very book that John has written, this very letter that he's written to the church. Well, one of the most obvious ones comes in the prayer that Jesus taught his disciples to pray. One of the things that we're told to pray every single day is, lead us not into temptation. If those born of God were unable to sin, that request would seem to be unnecessary. Why would we need to ask for that if we're unable to continue in sin? In Galatians 6 verse 1, Paul writes, Brothers, if anyone is caught in any transgressions, you who are spiritual should restore him in a spirit of gentleness. Keep watch on yourself, lest you too be tempted. Again, we'd say if if believers, born-again believers, were unable to continue in sin, wouldn't that warning be unnecessary? No need to restore someone else because they're not going to struggle with sin. No need to watch out for yourself because you're not going to be struggling. How do we make sense of of this in light of these verses? And also the verse in 1 John 1 verse 8 when John says, If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Here you have John, a born-again believer, talking to other born-again believers saying, If we say we don't have sin, we're deceiving ourselves. And yet here John says, the one who is born of sin, or the one who is born of God is unable to continue sinning. We wonder, how does this fit our theological beliefs about what it means for a believer to have a relationship with sin? How do we kind of fit these things together? It doesn't seem to fit our understanding of these passages of Scripture, and neither does this verse seem to fit with our own lived experience. I want you to imagine for a second a a mom and dad looking on in in their son's room to say goodnight to him. He's he's 17 years old, and and as they walk into his room to say goodnight, they notice that he's on his cell phone scrolling through some app. And and the parents are shocked. They say, Johnny, don't you know that you're not supposed to be on your phone at nighttime, especially not in your room? Like, we've talked about the dangers of the temptations of these devices, and and you know this is a rule. What are you doing on your phone? And And they're quite upset with him. And Johnny looks at them and says, Mom, Dad, don't you understand? I read this verse today that talks about how those who have been born of God are unable to keep on sinning. So I can just scroll on my phone all night and it's not going to lead to anything bad because it's impossible for me to continue sinning. Even if those parents couldn't explain to Johnny why his interpretation and application of that passage was incorrect, they would know from their own lived experience that it would not be a good idea to let Johnny just scroll on that phone all night because it could lead to some terrible things in his life. We, we recognize that from our own experience as well. 1 John 3 verse 9 is a very challenging verse. And often, if we're honest, what we do when we come to a verse like this is to think to ourselves, that's confusing. I don't understand how that fits and then just move on and go to something else that does seem a little bit more easy to understand. But this morning, we don't want to do this. We want to ask ourselves, what is John saying here and how are we to to think about how this applies to our own lives? But in order to talk about verse 9, we're not going to start in verse 9. We're going to go back to the first verses of this chapter and look at the stage that John sets in the the scaffolding that he kind of builds to help us understand what he's saying later in this chapter. 1 John 3, verses 1 to 3, says this, See what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. The reason why the world does not know us is that it did not know him. Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. And everyone who thus hopes in him purifies himself as he is pure. John describes believers as being part of God's family. And and as he says before and after this passage, we are part of God's family. We are God's children because we have been born of God. God. 
We have received a birth from God by his spirit. And John talks about this in different places throughout his writing, but probably the most famous and memorable being the story of Nicodemus. Many of you know the story of Nicodemus. In John chapter 3, he came to Jesus at night, and we don't know exactly why he came at night. Some people think it's, it's somehow symbolic. Other people think it's just because he was a little bit nervous to talk to Jesus when there was crowds around. But whatever the reason, we see that Nicodemus is enthralled by Jesus. He is captivated by Jesus and who he is. And he almost trips over himself giving flattery to Jesus. He says, no one is able to do such miraculous signs unless they have been sent from God. Now Jesus isn't interested in Nicodemus' flattery. But he latches on to something that Nicodemus says and he drives the conversation to the area of his greatest spiritual need. He says, Nicodemus, you want to talk about what's impossible apart from God's power? John 3, verse 3, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot or he is unable to see the kingdom of God. Now at this point, Nicodemus is confused. He, he has no idea what Jesus has just said, and he's, he's trying to puzzle it out. He's saying, Jesus, like, how can a person be born a second time? Like, that's, it, it seems to be very obvious that it's physically impossible. A person can't enter, you know, exit a, a, the mother's womb a second time. What are you talking about? And so Jesus repeats himself, this time emphasizing that the birth he's talking about is a spiritual birth, not a physical one. John 3, verse 5, Truly, truly, I say to you, Unless one is born of water and the Spirit, he cannot, he is unable to enter the kingdom of God. Now when Jesus talks about seeing the kingdom of God or entering the kingdom of God, he's using that term in a way that he sometimes uses the phrase to have eternal life. And so what Jesus is saying is that unless a person is born of God, unless a person is born again, he or she is unable to have eternal life. And it appears at this point Nicodemus is starting to understand what Jesus is saying, that the, the new birth, the spiritual new birth is necessary, but he still wonders how that could happen. So he asks Jesus, how can these things be? And Jesus responds, and the climax of his, his response comes in verses 14 and 15 when he says this, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. Jesus says we are able, a person is able to experience this new birth that leads to eternal life through faith in Jesus Christ. And John had already talked about this in the prologue of his gospel. In John chapter 1, verse 11 to 13, he says, Jesus came to his own, and his own people did not receive him, but to all who did receive him, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God who are born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. We see John saying that those who are born, or those who put their faith in Jesus are born of God. Those who are born of God have eternal life. The gift of spiritual rebirth through faith in Jesus is one of the greatest, if not the greatest gift God ever gave. And this is why John writes, See what kind of love the Father has given to us, that we should be called children of God. And so we are. This language that John uses of being born into God's family, to have this spiritual new birth, it shows us that when we talk about a person putting their faith in Jesus and becoming a Christian, it shows us that that's more then a sin transaction, it's a life transformation. Let me explain what I mean by that. When we talk about a person coming to faith, we often emphasize the sin transaction that takes place. And and this is important to do because there is a sin transaction that does take place when a person puts their faith in Jesus. And we see in the language of forgiveness that the Bible uses, that language is taken from the world of accounting and the world of financial transactions. And we understand that because of our sin, we have a debt before God, a debt so large that we can never pay it on our own. But the good news is that Jesus on the cross, he took the payment, he he paid the price for our debt, he took that debt on himself so that we could be forgiven and we could be called 
righteous in God's sight, that we could be justified before him. Jesus took the debt that we owed so that we could be forgiven. In Colossians chapter 2, verse 14, Paul tells the church that God has forgiven all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. And so we had a record of debt that stood against us. Jesus moved that aside, nailing it to the cross. He took away our record of debt so that we could be forgiven and counted as righteous. Now, I think most of us, most people are very happy to embrace a transactional understanding of faith. Jesus will take away my sin. He'll take away my shame. He'll take away the punishment of my sin. And, and, and that sounds pretty good to me. I can go to heaven when I die and nothing else has to change. Or so we say. Because in normal life, when a debt is paid on our behalf, or even when we pay off a debt, we, we can have a debt taken care of or paid for without that actually changing who we are in any fundamental way. Uh, years ago now, when Jamie and I paid off our student loan debts from college, we were excited. We did a little dance. We were, you know, we told some people close to us. But we were still the same people before the debt was paid as we were after that debt was paid. The debt was something out there. It was something apart from us. And now that the debt was paid, we could just go on with life as normal. But what may be true in terms of financial debts in our daily life is not true when it comes to the debt of sin that Christ paid on our behalf. When the New Testament talks about putting our faith in Jesus, they're clear that it's more than just a sin transaction. There's a life transformation that takes place. Coming back to that verse in Colossians 2 that we just read where it talks about Jesus taking the debt and, and, and setting it aside, nailing it to the cross. If you go back just one verse, it shows us how that life transformation and sin transaction work together. In Colossians 2 verse 13 and 14 it says, And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him having forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands, this he set aside, nailing it to the cross. Paul, John, the New Testament writers show us that we cannot separate the life transformation from that sin transaction. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ, we are forgiven and we are born into this family of God. We become God's children. I love the way that John says it. He says, see what kind of love the Father has given to us that we should be called children of God. And so we are. I, I like the way that he, he puts it right at the end there. It's a, we are called children of God, not because it just sounds nice, not because it would be a nice idea. No, it says, because so you are. When we put our faith in Jesus, we are born again into God's family and we become God's children. It's a life transformation and it's a new identity that we have in him. Now I, I know it, it's very popular for us in evangelical circles and in Christian circles to say when people ask us who we are to answer by saying we are sinners. And I think I, I know why we say this. We want to make sure that we are that we are clear that we have received grace from God, that it's not by our own righteousness that we're saved, that we are sinners who are saved by God. We don't want to come across as holier than thou or as if we are somehow, uh, you know, a, a better type of person or just a, on a different plane from the rest of the world. We say, I'm a sinner, you're a sinner, we're all sinners. And we know in our lives, we struggle with indwelling sin. We struggle to live righteously before God. But the question I want us to consider this morning is the question of, is that the primary identity we want to embrace or that God calls us to embrace when he has caused us to be born again as children in his family? Now, I want to be clear, and, and please don't mishear me. The, the New Testament authors are very clear. All have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. 
And the most important moment in a person's life is when they recognize the full weight of their sin and rebellion before God and they turn to God to receive his forgiveness and to receive new life in him. But again, the New Testament authors talk about this life transformation. We are born into God's family. In 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9 to 10, Paul writes about people who are walking in rebellion against God. And and he he starts listing off all these sins and he's listing off all these, these people who are living these lives of sin. And he gets to the end of this list and he tells the church in Corinth, he says, And such were some of you. But you were washed, you were sanctified, you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of our God. Now, when you read the book of Corinthians, you realize very quickly that this church is not a perfect church. Like, you you read through the chapters and you realize, it seems like the Corinthian church are doing all the things that Paul just talked about. He's telling them to turn away from this sin, turn away from this sin. They're doing all these things. And yet, as Paul gives this list of sins, he says, and such were some of you. He seems to be saying, yeah, you, you're wrestling with these things and, and you're, you're in dependence on God trying to, to have victory in these things. You, you're doing a lot of these things that I'm talking about, but that's not who you are anymore. There is a place where Paul talks about himself as a sinner in the present tense. and It's in 1 Timothy 1 verse 15. It's worth looking at that because there Paul says, the saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. Paul says, I'm the foremost example of a sinner. But look what he writes next in verse 16. He says, but I have received mercy for this reason, that in me as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who, want, who were to believe in him. That sinner was shown mercy and that sinner became a child of God and a servant of God. In Romans 6, Paul writes to the church, and he says, you used to be slaves of sin, but in verse 22 he says, you have been set free from sin and have become slaves of God. Will we still sin? Yeah, First John 1 verse 8 makes that clear, but it also is clear that that is not who we are anymore. I want you to imagine a young boy who grew up on the streets with no family. In order to survive, he stole and he cheated and he hurt people closest to him. He, he ended up in juvenile detention. And his life was was heading down one trajectory, but in juvenile detention, a a young couple adopted that boy. They brought him into their home and they declared to him, you are our son and we love you. If someone were to ask that young boy, who are you? How should he respond? He might say, well, I I, I guess I'm a liar and a thief and I'm a delinquent because that's what my record says and that's what people have been saying my whole life but if his father heard him say that he would put his hands on his shoulders he would look him in the eye and he would say you are not a liar you are not a thief you are not a delinquent you are my son and my son is none of those things yeah but dad sometimes I still do those things but that's not who you are And you need to become who I have made you. God the Father says to us, you are my children. Become who I have made you in Christ Jesus. As Christians, as those who have been born into the family of God, we will continue to wrestle with sin. But our relationship to sin is fundamentally changed when we receive a new identity as God's children. And we see this so clearly as we continue reading now in verses 4 through 10. John writes, Everyone who makes a practice of sinning also practices lawlessness. Sin is lawlessness. You know that he appeared in order to take away sins, and in him there is no sin. No one who abides in him keeps on sinning. No one who keeps on sinning has either seen him or known him. 
Little children, let no one deceive you. Whoever practices righteousness is righteous as he is righteous. Whoever makes a practice of sinning is of the devil, for the devil has been sinning from the beginning. The reason the Son of God appeared was to destroy the works of the devil. No one born of God makes a practice of sinning, for God's seed abides in him, and he cannot keep on sinning because he has been born of God. By this it is evident who are the children of God and who are the children of the devil. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is the one who does not love his brother. These are some challenging words for us, and it's a reminder again that when Jesus saved us, he didn't only remove the debts that our sin incurred, he freed us from the power of sin so that we can walk in newness of life. And that new life gives evidence of the transforming work that he has accomplished in us. We are no longer living under the power of sin, forced to carry out the desires of the flesh. We live under the power of the Holy Spirit to carry out the will of the Lord. We are God's children. When I was growing up, I had a lot of cousins. Uh, on my mom's side alone, there was 30 of us, and, and that meant when I went to elementary school, there was at some points 20 of us cousins all in the same school. Uh, you can imagine what that would have been like, or maybe you can't imagine, but it, w- it was quite something. And we had a saying in our family, and, and there's sometimes it was good, sometimes it maybe led to not so good things, but the saying was, coys stick up for each other. Uh, that was my mom's maiden name, Koi. And so uh, the 20 of us in the school, that was kind of our motto, that Koi's stood up for each other. We, we fought for each other if necessary. We, we went to bat for each other. There's this idea that if one Koi was suffering, the, the rest would stand up for them and stick up for them. And so when I went to school, I didn't have to fear bullies. I didn't have to fear anything like that because I knew I had older cousins and Koi's stood up for each other. Now, what's interesting is that I would say that when I was in kindergarten. And I embraced that as part of my identity even back then before I had ever had a chance or the ability to make that a reality in my life. Before I ever had the opportunity to stick up for one of my cousins, that's already the identity that I had embraced because that was the identity and the ideal of our family that we lived towards. In a similar way, we can say that God's family has an identity and an ideal that we live towards. Children of God are like God's son, Jesus. Children of God don't sin because they are sons and daughters of a God who is perfectly holy. John gives us the picture of what a child of God is like, and he urges us to become who we are in Christ. I think Howard Marshall sums it up quite well in his commentary when he writes this, and I'm quoting here. He says, John is describing the ideal character of the Christian. Ideal in the sense that this is the reality intended by God for him, even if he falls short of it while he still lives in this sinful world. The person who is conscious of the new beginning that God has made in his life will seek to let that divine ideal become more and more of a reality. The Christian can grasp the new life of the Spirit and is being changed into the likeness of Christ. Only at the consummation will the process be completed. And again, think back to what John writes. He says, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared. But we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. We are already God's children Only at the consummation will we be made perfectly holy. In the meantime, through the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit, connected to Jesus, who is the vine, we become who we are in Christ. Now, some people have misunderstood 1 John 3, verse 9, to teach that as believers, we will reach a state of sinless perfection here on this side of eternity. They look at this and say, yeah, it's, it's possible that maybe, you know, you'll reach age 42 and then from that point on until you're 82, you just won't sin anymore and, and there'll be no sin in your life. Now, most of us here would, would scoff at that and say, how could people believe that? But our mistake is usually on the opposite end of the spectrum. You see, we often get so comfortable with sin in our lives thinking that it's just an inevitable and basically harmless part of our lives as followers of Jesus. Jesus. 
Maybe it's because we've taken that transactional view of Christianity, again, where we say that Jesus can save me from my sins, he can take that debt, but then I'm free to just live however I want. Because if we take that view that it's only a transaction, then, yeah, I can, I can sin as much as I want because Jesus' blood covers all those sins and I can just do and say and think and feel whatever I want to do. Or maybe it's because in the battle against sin, we've just resigned ourselves to the idea that it's a hopeless battle we're never going to win. When you're in a fight and you think there's just no chance I'm ever going to overcome, there's just no hope for me ever to have victory, it's easy for us to just say this is just the way that it's going to be and I just need to embrace that this will be a major part of my life from here on out. But again, John challenges us here. The New Testament authors, they challenge that perspective. They remind us it's not just a sin transaction. Our faith is a life transformation that gives us power in this battle against sin. The Apostle Paul talks about this in Romans 6. He says, We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. He says later, do not present your members to sin as instruments for unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those who have been brought from death to life and your members to God as instruments for righteousness, for sin will have no dominion over you. And so as Christians, we must never be comfortable with sin in our lives, thinking this is just inevitable and this is just kind of a harmless part of our walk with God. We are called to put sin to death recognizing that through the Holy Spirit, victory is possible and necessary. When I was in my early 20s, I was, uh, for at least a summer, into rock climbing pretty, uh, pretty regularly. And I would go to the, the climbing gym, and I would do some bouldering, and I'd do some just different routes. And, and I kind of got into this sport a little bit and did some research on people who were at the top level. And, and at the top level of climbing, there's, there's always people who are trying to push the limits of what's physically and humanly possible. Uh, these, these people are kind of on a different level from your average person, but they're trying to figure out, just like we see in the Olympics these days, what's the level of what's humanly possible? And oftentimes, the greatest climbers in the world, they'll all be working on the same problems. There'll be a problem or a route that no one has ever climbed before and they're all working on this same thing for months, sometimes even for years, and they're all trying to figure out who's going to be the first one to climb it. Who's going to have the first ascent is the word that they use in the climbing world. And it's amazing to watch how so long nobody will climb it, but then all of a sudden, as soon as the first person does, it feels like, other people just start doing it so quickly afterwards. And people have wondered why this is, why, you know, as the route become easier, the climbers just all become stronger at the same time. Those might play into at least the second one, but I think more likely you climb differently when you know the climb is possible. I think for us, we fight differently in the battle against sin when we know that victory is possible. When you resign to defeat, it's easy to just feel defeated and to not even put up a fight. But when you know that through the power of the Holy Spirit and through the Word of God and through the community of believers that victory over sin is possible, it changes the way you fight the battle. If you have a relationship with God through faith in Jesus Christ, Not only has Jesus taken away the punishment and the penalty of your sin, he's given you new life. God has given you new life by the Holy Spirit. It's not just a sin transaction, it's a life transformation. You used to be a sinner living under the power of sin, enslaved to the desires of the flesh, but now you are a child of God, living under the power of the Holy Spirit and led by God himself. Victory over sin is possible and it's a necessary expression of the reality of that new life. Again, it's not in our own strength. It's not just a matter of trying harder or doing better. It's a matter of God living his life through us. 
of the Holy Spirit indwelling and empowering us as we seek to make this reality that God has made in our lives, this fact that we are children of God, to make that a reality in our action. Through Jesus, we are children of God. So by the power of the Spirit, may we become who he has made us in Christ. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word. Father, your word challenges us in profound ways. And Father, this morning as we reflect on our own lives and as we think about our identity as your children and as we think about a relationship to sin, Father, we recognize just the need to to fight this battle as if we have the victory. Because through the transforming work in our lives that you have done, we, we can find that victory. Father, I pray that you'd help us to learn what it means to be your children, that we would become who you have made us through Christ Jesus. And Father, as we come to the table now, the Lord's table for the time of communion, we pray, God, that you would help us to bear in mind all these things that we have been wrestling with this morning. And God, we we do thank you for your great forgiveness and your great love for us. And we pray that the Lord's table would remind us of these great truths as we carry them forward into our lives. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. In John chapter 2,